Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mama Wears Athleisure. I am your host, Mariella de Santiago, a first time mom. We focus on all things mom with tips to help make life easier and more organized for all you mamas out there. Hey listeners, we will be talking about bodily fluids and pelvic floor function in case you'd like to put headphones on or make sure you're in a space you're comfortable being in. Hi everyone, today I am here with Jessica who is a physical therapist and we are going to talk a little bit about our pelvic floor postpartum. Jessica, tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Yeah, absolutely. So I am uh, Dr. Jessica London. I am a physical therapist that is specializing in pelvic floor physical therapy, but also more specifically with pregnancy and postpartum. I also have two littles of my own that are 10 months and three and a half years old. I am a C-section mom and also an H-back or V-back. So I had a V-back at home. So I've had the pleasure of experiencing two completely different birth, labor, and postpartum experiences. And And through this, I sort of found this massive gap in care, which uh, led me to start your postpartum PT and wellness. And that is um, the company that is able to meet more moms where they're at and help raise the standard of public health education, care, and postpartum recovery without having so many barriers. So that's a little bit about me. And I reside in Arizona too. That's another fun fact. Oh, awesome. So you're pretty close to us. I'm in San Diego. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Most women probably already know this, but can you share a little bit about what is the pelvic floor? Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of times we don't even realize we have a pelvic floor until we have a baby, right? (laughs) Or until we start having issues and they're like, why, why is that happening? And it's like, oh, it's your pelvic floor. And you're like, what's that? Right. We did a really uh, poor job of doing health education in just general schooling. And so the pelvic floor is a group of muscles that kind of sit at the bottom of the pelvis, sort of like a hammock or a bowl and they span from the very front of your pubic bone. So if you were to sort of feel the front of your pelvis and that big pubic bone, a lot of people have like pubic symphysis dysfunction here. So you may be like, oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. That's kind of right in that crotch area. So it spans from that part of the bone all the way back to your tailbone. And then it also spans from your sit bone to sit bone. So if you're kind of sitting right now and you're rocking side to side, you should feel those two bony landmarks. And those are called your ischial tuberosities or your sit bones. And so the pelvic floor is in that entire area. It is kind of spanning that entire zone. Um, And it's also three layers deep. It has multiple layers to it. It has multiple functions. And the pelvic floor is really responsible for bowel and bladder control, to supporting your pelvic organs, your bladder, your rectum, your uterus. It's also responsible for providing the bottom of the core, the stability of the the pelvis and the entire abdomen, and then the lower extremity as well. And then it's also a sump pump for the body. So it helps pump blood and lymphatic fluid back up to the heart to recirculate. Uh, And lastly, it also has the function of sexual function. So it, uh, you know, how you make a baby, how you birth a baby, all the things. Um, So the pelvic floor comes into a part of all of those things. And oftentimes we don't realize its role until we find dysfunction in one of those areas, dysfunction in, you know, having poor bladder control or um, intimacy or any of those symptoms that I've just kind of talked about their functions of. You mentioned something that was very important that a lot of people don't realize the importance of a pelvic floor or that we even have that until we are either pregnant or have already had a baby. So I kind of want to focus on that a little bit because we really don't talk about it very much. And as moms, it is really important because it's everything that you need in order to be able to have this baby. What happens to your pelvic floor once you've had that baby? So postpartum, what's going on? Yeah, I think it really depends on the birth that you have. So, uh, you know, even if you have a C-section, you're not, your pelvic floor is not spared. And I think oftentimes a lot of people who have a C-section feel like, oh, I don't need pelvic floor therapy. My pelvic floor is going to be fine because I had a C-section. And I just like to start off by busting that one myth because oftentimes people who have a C-section tend to have other things going on that are still very much related to the pelvic floor. And also remembering we carried a baby, you know, for nine, 10 months and the pelvic floor was supporting that via the uterus, that the uterus is supported by the pelvic floor, right? So the pelvic floor did sustain some external additional load. Even post cesarean, people can deal with like pain with intimacy or have some fascial integrations or pelvic floor muscle tension built up because then it also never really got that release from a vaginal birth experience. So our C-section mom, mamas might feel 
different than our vaginal birth mamas in terms of their pelvic floor postpartum. Typically, early postpartum, C-section moms might feel some like guarding and tightness and tension. And then vaginal birth, interestingly enough, the levator ani muscle, which is one of the um, larger pelvic floor muscles, since it's made up of multiple pelvic floor muscle group, the levator ani actually stretches two and a half times its normal resting length in order for a baby to pass through the perineum and through the vaginal canal. So in postpartum, from a vaginal birth standpoint, we We've just stretched this tissue to its max capacity. We may or may not have had tearing. Typically, first time moms will absolutely have some form of tearing uh, up to a second degree, if not worse. With episiotomies or forceps or vacuum deliveries, this all affects the perineum and the pelvic floor even greater and kind of sets the mom up for a little bit harder of a recovery. So the pelvic floor is spared, if you will. It is a traumatic event, in no matter if you had a C section or a vaginal birth. But, you know, kind of in those first early weeks, postpartum, your pelvic floor was stretched quite a bit or sustained quite a bit of load. And it really is in need of some recalibration or reconnection from the nervous system to the muscles because it's sort of fuzzy and it's in its connection point and being able to provide all of those functions that I listed early on of the role of the pelvic floor. Thank you for mentioning all of that about the C-section. I also myself had a C-section and, you know, you don't really know very much when you go into it. And afterwards, you don't realize like, oh, I still actually have things that are going on. Like it's not completely spared. Like there's still bleeding and shedding of whatever you have going on. You just don't think about that. You you learn as you go Mm -hmm. and it's still very always uncomfortable. I think it doesn't really matter which type of delivery that you have. So I love that you did mention the fact that it's still important for C-section moms to focus on that. And you made a really, really good point about once you get intimate, after like that there's this pain that women don't really realize or even know why. Yeah, definitely. And I think too, like with vaginal births, you know, especially since I know I'm not sure about your birth experiences, but for mine, like being able to experience a C-section recovery and then also a vaginal birth recovery, I sort of like really was eye opened. It was an eye opening experience for me to say like, wow, those were totally two different recovery experiences and they were harder in some ways. And then they were easier in some ways, depending on the method of birth. But definitely those first couple of weeks from a parent public floor standpoint, the vaginal birth was more of an intensity, I, if I could say, from the public floor specific. But the C-section was like my whole body was recovering from massive abdominal surgery and my public floor was sore, but it was a different, like more localized from a vaginal birth perspective. You know, some of the things that moms talk about postpartum of like it being really painful to pee and to go poop and all of those things, those can be different vaginal birth versus C-section birth too. They're both hard, either both equally hard and both both equally easier in different ways, I would say. With that, what are some common problems that you tend to see postpartum with? You kind of see a lot of people post like, oh, I sneezed and I leaked a little or I laughed. And so you start to see that moms tend to kind of normalize this. But what are some common things that are seen as maybe normalized, but maybe it's more that we need to pay attention to our pelvic floor and see someone? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm super biased. I think everyone, no matter what birth experience, should integrate some sort of pelvic floor postnatal rehab just to help the body reconnect to its core and to its pelvic floor and to really rehab from the event that happened. We have a knee injury or ankle injury and rehab is like very standard of care to be able to function in the way that we want to function. And then women grow a baby, have a baby and various methods. And there's like, we're sort of just left to figure it out on our own without true guidance and rehab. And so no matter what birth experience, I'd, I'd first say everyone is a candidate for, for recovery, for pelvic floor and postnatal recovery. But more specifically, things to really look out for to kind of raise that red flag even higher is the first six weeks, you may have some leakage and that's actually quite common. You may just get out of your bed and try to make it to the bathroom. You just are pouring down with urine, right? Or you just might not make it in time those first few early weeks. But if you're getting beyond six weeks, you know, five, six, seven, eight weeks postpartum, and you're still dealing with leakage of any kind, whether you just can't make it to the bathroom in time and feeling like that urge is so intense and you're not able to stop that urge and you leak along the way. If you're getting uh, more frequent urges less than two hours, this is a pelvic floor issue. Um, If you're leaking with coughing, sneezing, running, any sort of exercise beyond this like six, seven, eight week mark, this is definitely also a concern for more or more of a bigger red flag pain with urination or bowel movements as well. Once we 
rule out, go to your urogyne or your gynecologist and rule out any sort of infection. It could also be very much a pelvic floor issue. Any pain with intimacy really, you know, past that three month marker of healing is a cause for a bigger red flag to reach out to a pelvic floor specialist as well. So there's a lot of reasons that people will maybe have it as a higher priority to work on their pelvic floor, but everyone should, I feel like everyone should get that access and that granted, you know, next step to their recovery, but not everyone will be able to. And so those are some like big red flags to think about any differences with sexual function, bladder and bowel function, feeling like uh, you have any like organs sort of falling through the vaginal canal. If you're feeling that pelvic heaviness or bulging, these are all common causes of potential prolapse. So it's just best to get early support and recovery. With all of that that you just mentioned, what are some things that moms can do to hopefully strengthen their pelvic floor before they go see a therapist? Anything that they can just work on at home? And I know often you read about kegels, whether they're good or not, but that seems to be like the common one that women think is what you need to do. Yeah, it's so interesting because kegels are really great for some group of individuals and really terrible for others, right? So if you had a C-section and you're already super guarded, tight, and tense, then doing more kegels on top of that is just sort of like strengthening a muscle in a very shortened position anyways. And it's actually not allowing you to get the full optimal function of that muscle that you want. So thinking of the pelvic floor post-birth, I would say the most important thing is like, can you connect to your pelvic floor from a visual mind-body connection standpoint? Like if everyone right now closed their eyes, could they find their pelvic floor? Could they find their urethra? Could they find their vaginal opening? Could they find their rectal opening? Just closing their eyes, thinking about it somatically. Can they connect from that mind body connection. And then beyond that, can they contract that area that from at the urethra, at the vaginal opening, at the rectal opening? Can they contract it? But then also can they relax it? Do they have a more difficult time contracting and connecting or do they have a more difficult time relaxing and lengthening that pelvic floor group of muscles? So most important is really just reconnecting to that area because one, we might have learned from the very first time we had a pelvic floor after we had a baby or two, we're just having a really difficult time even connecting to that area. So for all of my clients, I always have, you know, visualization and reconnections the first couple of weeks. I also utilize breath work to do this too, because it can help us um, be able to understand and connect to our pelvic floor that way as well. So I guess to answer your big question, like Kegels can be helpful, but a true Kegel is like a contraction, but then also you need the relaxation. And I think oftentimes people think of Kegels as like, I'm just going to, you know, do a hundred of these a day. And it's like, what other body group are we tackling a hundred reps a day? That was like the worst advice that has ever been given to the entire population of pregnancy and postpartum. You know, I have so many moms that come to me and they're like, yeah, I've been doing my 200 Kegels a day. And I'm like, excuse me, stop doing that. (laughs) Because you would never do a hundred bicep curls a day or 200 bicep curls every single day. Like that muscle group is just so overactive. So we just want to be able to connect to it. Close your eyes, think of your bicep. You probably found it pretty quickly, but close your eyes, think of your pelvic floor and all those different parts of your pelvic floor, it's much harder to connect. So we want to make sure we have that neurological connection first from that mind body approach. And then from there, build off of it to each individual person. Does this person need more strengthening or does this person need more relaxation and lengthening? So it's, there's not one answer for everyone. Can you share how a PT would help with the pelvic floor for moms that are looking to either come to one while they're pregnant or right after they've had their babies? So, you know, there's a lot of interesting ways to be able to reach public floor therapists these days. And this can be a doctor of physical therapy, doctor of occupational therapy. So PTs or OTs are specializing in public floor rehab. So first and foremost, if you go to your OB and they send you to someone down the hall and it's likely a nurse doing Kegels and ESTEM, that is absolutely not a public floor specialist and you're not in the right area. That's like a nurse that is doing their best job trying to help you. But that's one of the biggest thing that therapy professionals are trying to bring awareness too, is that's not true specialization in public floor therapy. So first and foremost, if you're going to go in person, you want to find someone that is a therapy professional that has taken additional certifications in public floor specific work that can offer an internal public floor exam if you choose to accept one or if you choose to want that, because that is a part of in-person public floor therapy practice. It doesn't have to be, it's always an option, but it is one option to be able to reach some of those deeper pelvic floor muscles um, and to assess them appropriately. I say there's a lot of other 
access points. So for me, I'm about 90% virtual. And so for me, I can meet with people virtually all over the world and help you find that mind body connection and help you kind of realize, are you more high tone and tension or are you weaker? You know, where is that for you? And so I can kind of guide moms through specific instructions or approaches to be able to connect their pelvic floor a little bit more and ask them to do certain activities that is again, unique to each individual. So it's so hard to give one answer, but you know, you can also work with people from around the world that are doing virtual work as well. So it's sort of up to you on whether you want to go in person to someone, or if you're wanting to work with someone virtually. The virtual is such a good option for especially new moms that may not have help with a baby because you could go online while the baby is napping or while you're, if you're able to hold them while you do some of the work. So it's such a good alternative. Any other tips, suggestions, or recommendations? In general, um, I would say that I encourage moms to advocate for themselves and to um, know that they are valued and their pelvic floor and core recovery is also really important. So someone who gets early care, whether it's starting in pregnancy and just starting that connection, that pelvic floor core connection with a professional and pregnancy tends to have a better postpartum recovery experience. So early intervention is so important. You know, I've worked with moms as early as two or three weeks postpartum, if they're emotionally and mentally ready to do that, and they have support at home. So that's not a standard for everyone. However, the sooner that you can get started on tackling that reconnection and um, rehab is, is important because those who preventively work on it tend to have a decreased, you know, dysfunction ratings. If you preventively work on your pelvic floor and core prior to giving birth or within the first 12 weeks of giving birth before you, you know, sit with it for years and years, not doing anything, we can avoid a lot of these pelvic floor dysfunctions, such as leakage, pain with intimacy, prolapse and everything like that. So I would say what's so important is to take a preventative approach and reach out for support. And there's a lot of people out there that are willing to help you. Thank you for also mentioning that you can work with somebody as early as two weeks postpartum or three weeks postpartum, because I think that a lot of moms probably wouldn't even know when to start or how to even get started. So virtual and as soon as you're comfortable, both are such great options for moms to start looking for someone if they feel that they need that help. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking time, sharing your knowledge and walking us through all of these fun chats of postpartum care that we don't really get otherwise. Yes, of course. And it's really not standard of care. So you really have to advocate for yourself in terms of, you know, self-selecting your own provider or really asking your OB or midwife to refer you to someone if you're wanting to utilize insurance. But that's, sort of, you know, what's going on with the system is it's not a standard of care right now. So moms really do have to stand up and advocate for themselves to either kind of seek it out themselves or pay out of pocket or really advocate for themselves to get referred to a specialist that they can utilize um, with insurance. Thank you for all of that. Of course, this was such a great discussion. Thank you for being here and, you know, sharing this space with everyone to help moms kind of ease into postpartum and beyond. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week for our next episode. You can find us on Instagram for more updates and tips. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and give us a review if you like us.